Hi guys, Dane here, and today I am going to be doing my 2022 favourite books. So this is my top 40 books of the year. I take my top 10 books of each quarter, bring them all together, put them in a list, and uh, take you through them. Some of these might be difficult for me to talk about because it's been a long old while since I read them and also I don't want to talk too much about each book because then this book, this video would take forever. So we're just going to start with number 40. Biggie's down here, he says hello. Shay's off to one side doing some painting. Dane reads. We're going to start with number 40 which was Cycle of the Werewolf by Stephen King and it's basically, with King this is a short story, it's just kind of takes the form of a novella or at least it's published by itself um, because it's got some really beautiful illustrations and for me it was the illustrations that are really the reason why this even ranks in this list in the first place and it only just does. Other than that it's just a fairly forgettable short story. Then we have Emma Timpany, Three Roads and Other Stories. So um, this was a short story collection, literary fiction. It was sent to me by Isabel Kenyon of Fly on the Wall Poetry Press. Um, I can't remember the specifics of the uh, individual stories. I do remember it talked a lot about the word trivia um, because trivia was originally Three Roads, which is where the title comes from. And uh, yeah, I did do reviews of some of these as well, so I'll link to those below as and where appropriate. Then we have Fool's Paradise by Zoe Brooks. This was a poetry collection, another fly on the wall poetry press one, another good one, that's all I got for you. Peter James, Dead at First Sight. So this was a crime novel starring his uh, detective, Roy Grace. I can't tell you about this one for the simple fact that all of his books have dead in the titles, so they're like dead like you, dead as soon as you know it, dead at first sight. And so they all kind of blend together and I forget which ones are which, but it was pretty good. Then we have Dishonesty is the Second Best Policy by David Mitchell. So this is comedian David Mitchell, not Cloud Atlas David Mitchell. And this is a collection of some of the uh, articles that he wrote for the newspapers that he contributes to. Uh, he's got a very amusing sense of humour. I really like pretty much everything that he's done. The only downside to this is, is that they weren't linear. So um, it kind of jumps from one topic to another pretty quickly, as you would expect from a collection of... Um, you know, newspaper columns, so that's the only real downside to it, but still very fun, worth reading. Then we have The Andromeda Strain by Michael Crichton. So funnily enough, I, after reading this, I watched the movie of it, and I did think the movie was better, but it's basically your standard aliens come to Earth, how are we going to survive story, except written by Michael Crichton, who is kind of one of the masters of science fiction. Really well done, um, but the movie is better, so just, just watch the movie. Then we have The Call of the Weird by Louis Theroux, so Louis Theroux being the investigative journalist and in this one it's uh, he goes back around and meets a bunch of the people that he met during his Weird Weekends TV show and he just kind of catches up with them, sees what's different, meets everyone from like racists to extreme Christians to porn stars to goodness knows what else. Um, and it's just kind of fun to see what they're getting up to. It helps if you have seen the original series, but I don't think it's necessarily mandatory. But uh, yeah, it was interesting. It did have the same problem that David Mitchell's book had though, where it does jump around a little bit. Then we have Brian Herbert and Kevin J. Anderson, The Butlerian Jihad. This is one of the uh, Dune, expanded Dune series books. Uh, and this one covers the war against the machines, uh, the humans versus the machines, which I always just find any, anything to do with that, uh, you know, AI robots, all of that stuff. I'm always fascinated by it. And uh, yeah, I think this was book number two in that particular trilogy. The whole trilogy was pretty good, to be honest. Then we have House Carino, also by Brian Herbert and Kevin J. Anderson. So this was the third in the, oh, cat's meerkatting. This is the third in the uh, trilogy uh, that focuses on each of the houses. So we have House Atreides, House Harkonnen, and House Carino. House Carino is like the presidential house, I suppose. Um, and yeah, just more prequely goodness. Like really good stuff if you want to learn more about the law of the Dune universe. Law spelled L-O-R-E. Then we have A Short History of Nearly Everything by Bill Bryson, and this does exactly what it sounds like. It is a non-fiction book that covers a short history of nearly everything. Um, I seem to, no, no, that, I was thinking of a different one. This covers a lot of science stuff, so it starts with a big bang, covers a lot of physics, um, and then covers like more recent inventions. It is really, even though it's a short history of nearly everything, makes it sound like a history book, it's actually kind of a history of science book but uh, fascinating nonetheless. Then we have The Sound of Broken Ribs by Edward Lawn. So this is the second Edward Lawn book that I've read. It's kind of a thriller. The cat is right here in front of the camera. Uh, it's kind of a thriller. Lots of people are dying. Somebody is in a car accident that isn't really an accident. People are out to get revenge. People are going around like stabbing people and shit. It's just good. It's very gory, as you would expect with a title like The Sound of Broken Ribs. 
Then we have Eccentric Circles by Cynthia Brackett Vincent. I may be a little bit biased because this is a uh, anthology of authors from Encircle Publications and one of my stories, I uh, can't remember which one actually, but one of my stories from um, The Lightfold Files was included in there and then also short stories by a load of other uh, authors from Encircle. And I think for me the reason I enjoyed it so much was that um, I, I kind of knew a lot of these authors through Facebook and social media but I hadn't read any of their work so it was, it was exciting to finally get down and read some. Then we have Pirate Latitudes by Michael Crichton. So this one is a fiction book, it's historical fiction about pirates. What more do you need to know? Um, Crichton is actually really surprisingly good at writing um, historical fiction, even though again he's, he's mostly known for uh, science fiction. And yeah, if you like pirates, and even if you don't particularly like pirates, I think you'll like it. Um, I enjoyed it because there was a lot of just like swashbuckling sword and sorcery style things, except without any sorcery. Then we have Asking for Trouble by Tori Wag. Tori is a poet that I met at a, uh, a, a gig that my band was playing at. I also had books for sale and we ended up buying a copy of each other's books. And yeah, Asking for Trouble. It was her second uh, poetry collection. Either her second or her new one might be her second, I can't remember now. Um, but yeah, some really good poetry in that. I did a video review of that as well. I will link below to as many of these video reviews as I can. Then we have Dune, The Duke of Caladan by Brian Herbert and Kevin J. Anderson. So another Dune prequel. Um, I read a lot of the Dune books and they were all very good, so that's why there's quite a few of them in this old list. Um, this one focuses mostly on Duke Leto Atreides, who's one of my favorite characters. And because it's the first book of a trilogy, it does a really good job of sort of setting things up, setting up a lot of intrigue so that we're kind of sitting there thinking, okay, what's gonna come next? Then we have Oryx and Crake by Margaret Atwood. So this was uh, post-apocalyptic literary fiction. Um, basically, there has been a sort of a cataclysmic event that has mostly wiped out human beings. There are genetically modified animals and kind of genetically modified people knocking around. And um, we follow a main character as he tries to put all the pieces together because he's having a lot of flashbacks as well. Um, and so he's trying to figure out how things got to the state that they're in and if there's anything he can do to fix it. Then we have The Edible Woman by Margaret Atwood. So this was um, very kind of, again, probably literary fiction, but without the science fiction and without the dystopian side set in our society. Um, and it follows some, some relatively normal people and has some like nice feminist themes in it. Um, you know, things about pregnancy and whether they're gonna keep the baby and like a woman's role in society and all of this stuff. And it's particularly interesting to me because and Atwood said that she hadn't really, um, she wasn't really familiar with the feminist movement and the women's rights movement at the time and it's since gone on to be like an important piece of literature for that particular movement. Okay, we're starting to get to the books I remember a little bit more. Uh, we have The Card Turner by Louis Sakar. So this is the guy who wrote Holes. Um, the Card Turner is a, st a standalone. It's about a young lad who ends up getting into bridge, basically, hence The Card Turner. Um, and it's really cool because you learn a lot about how bridge is played and the strategies behind bridge and all of that stuff, um, while also just having a pretty good, like, kind of like a young adult slash middle grade read as well. Then we have God Is Not Great by Christopher Hitchens. I listened to this via an audio book. And um, Hitchens and is, goes along with uh, Dawkins as being one of the, like, the big prominent atheists. And uh, God Is Not Great, it wasn't as good, uh, it wasn't great. It wasn't as good as The God Delusion because that was very methodical and took arguments one by one and kind of demolished them. Whereas in God Is Not Great, it was very much uh, uh, Hitchens kind of speaking from his own experiences of God and religion and all of that stuff. And uh, yeah, it was still interesting. It's just, I would have preferred something a bit more, I don't know, more theoretical. Because he'd be talking about like, yeah, well I know a Sikh woman who believes so and so, and it's like, great, but is that what all Sikh women believe? Like, is that a global thing? Is that just unique to that one person? He didn't really put it into that wider context. Then we have House Arrest by Alan Bennett. So these are his pandemic diaries written during the first COVID lockdown. Um, really interesting stuff. His diaries aren't always particularly palatable, but this was quite a short collection. I only covered a year or so. And it was just interesting to see how he survived during COVID, um, the, how it changed his relationship with his other half, Rupert, and all of that stuff. And I think in the future, people are gonna look back on it as being like an important, um, an important artifact of our times. 
Okay, so up next we have Christine by Stephen King. This is a book about a haunted car, essentially. Um, it's almost YA, but it is also horrific as well. It's It's got YA characters, but I would say it's written for an adult audience. I mean, I'm sure you could still read it if you were younger. I really liked it. I think part of the reason why was because there were a lot of references to old school rock and roll songs, and I'm a big old school rock and roll fan. I'm not a big car person, um, but I like the characterization. Like Christine, the car actually feels like it's a character, but then we have like the old dude in it whose name I forgotten he was great as well just a general good book then we have a walk in the woods by bill bryson so this is about uh, non-fiction about him walking the uh, appalachian trail with his friend cats they don't walk the full trail he kind of explains you have to be a bit crazy to do that because it takes like eight or nine months but they walked a good chunk of it and he just writes about his experiences along the way it's very humorous very engaging travel writing um, and i particularly liked it because my shout out to corey my uh, friend corey well friend slash colleague corey from one of my clients is also from Appalachia, so that was pretty cool. Then we have The Trouble with Goats and Sheep by Joanna Cannon. So this is uh, Charles Heathcote here on Booktube, one of his favourite books of all time. I can see why. It's set during the heatwave in the 70s, and I actually read it during the heatwave we had earlier this year, um, which was kind of fitting, I suppose. I guess I'd say it's like a mixture between literary fiction and general fiction with a bit of mystery thrown in. Worked really well, did enjoy. Do check it out. Then we have The Disappearance of Adele Badeau by Graham McRae Burnett, and that is the same. It's kind of literary fiction, um, mystery fiction. Leans heavier towards the mystery fiction. It is about uh, a waitress goes missing, and uh, we sort of follow one of the suspects, really, as um, you know the investigation proceeds, and we never really quite know who did it, and even if anything was done. Um, just really well written. I've enjoyed everything by Graham McRae Burnett that I've read so far. Then we have Skeleton Crew by Stephen King. So this is a short story collection. It also has the novella of The Mist in there, which is one of my favorite movies because of the ending. Um, King doesn't have the same ending in his, his novella and I would argue the movie ending is better. It's pretty much the bleakest ending of anything I've ever seen. Um, really well done. But yeah, it was still great to go back and read The Mist. Funnily enough, I'd picked this up secondhand and I started reading it and I discovered my edition had a misprint in it and it was missing like 50 pages, including the end of The Mist. So I had to get my friend Joe to uh, Amazon Prime me a new, a new edition of it. But yes, it was very good. One of his better story collections. Then we have The Blade Artist by Irvin Welsh. So this follows Begbie, who's one of his recurring characters. I think he was in Train Spotting. He's been in a bunch of the other ones, Francis Begbie. And by this point, he's living in an America. He's living in America and he's uh, making a living as an artist. He's the Blade Artist. He basically does like portraits of celebrities and then will like set fire to them or cut them with knives and all of this stuff. Um, which is very Begbie. But yeah, then uh, his son dies and he goes back to uh, Scotland for the funeral and stuff and we sort of see whether you can teach an old dog new tricks and the nature of change whether it's possible to be a truly changed man then we have Daryl by Jackie S. So this is a novel about cuckolding. Uh, the main guy is a guy called Daryl. Uh, he likes to watch his wife have sex with people. And uh, it's got all kinds of interesting themes. It's got some LGBTQIA plus themes as well. It's published by Clash Books, who are a very cool publisher, um, run by somebody I know, Christoph Paul, uh, and his wife, Lisa. Uh, they have a son now. Shout out to Remy as well. He's 18 months or something like that now I think and um, yeah just really good fiction very good I can't say anything in it that uh, either A I didn't say in my review or check out Say Kevy on YouTube uh, check out Kevy's review because she did it better then we have Billy Summers by Stephen King so this takes on the trope of the one last job so Billy Summers is like a hitman for hire very good shot uh, but he gets hired to do one last assassination job. Um, he prides himself. He only kills people who deserve it. And um, yeah, while he's kind of keeping his cover, um, he's kind of acting in character, but he's pretending to be a novelist. And so he starts writing. Um, so he becomes a writer, which is very Stephen King as well. But yeah, just a pretty good Stephen King thriller. Then we have The Air of Caladan by Brian Herbert and Kevin J. Anderson. So this is the highest out of all the Brian Herbert and Kevin J. Anderson books that I've rated. I don't know how it ended up like this because I think if you'd asked me when I was finishing reading it, I wouldn't have ranked it that high. Um, but I had a little bit of kind of an afterthought of it and bumped it up because it does a really good job of uh, setting things up for the first Dune book. Um, like literally it's pretty much the last 50 or 100 pages of that book really make it up to that point it was like a 3.5 out of 5 and those last 50 or 100 pages bumped it up to a 4.5 out of 5 um, as you can tell from the era of Caladan it follows mostly Paul Atreides who isn't my favourite character but I think that's kind of the point of Paul Atreides um, but yeah it is worth sticking with and I would definitely recommend it to Dune fans 
Then we have Project Hail Mary by Andy Weir. So this was the last book that I read in, of, the, of the year. And um, this is sci-fi, kind of hard sci-fi. Basically, there's, there's this stuff called Astrophage, um, which is threatening to destroy the Earth. It, it kind of breeds on sunlight. And because of that, the Earth is undergoing like dramatic cooling. We've actually accidentally bought ourselves some time due to global warming as well. Um, but an astronaut goes off on a suicide mission to try and find a way to stop it. And we kind of follow him on the ship um, and it's interspersed with flashbacks because he has amnesia and we later on find out exactly why that is and there's a pretty good explanation for it as well I don't always like it when that's used in books but I did think it worked pretty well there so yeah then we have the Marlowe Murder Club by Robert Thorogood so this is a kind of an amusing quirky mystery uh, set in Marlowe which is a town just around the corner from me Robert Thorogood is the guy who wrote uh, Death in Paradise this is his first non-Death in Paradise novel, and it was very good. Um, if you've read the Richard Osman one, the, the Thursday Murder Club, they're very similar premises. Uh, it turns out to just be one of those quirks of fate. The two didn't know about it, and the two books kind of came out at the same time, uh, which I think is a shame, especially for Robert Thorogood, because I think his book was the better of the two. But yeah, if you liked Richard Osman's book, you'll like Robert Thorogood's book. And if you didn't like Richard Osman's book, you should still try Robert Thorogood. There's a reason. I read them both this year, and Richard Osman's one didn't uh, appear on my list. Okay, then we have Fairy Tale by Stephen King, and as you can tell, this has elements of fairy tale and fantasy, specifically portal fantasy. Follows a teenage boy in our world. Uh, his mum died in a car accident, and then his elderly neighbour uh, breaks his leg, and he ends up kind of looking after him and looking after his dog, and discovering that this man has some secrets. Um, I really like the first third of it, which is all set in our world, and which was much more like grittier than the, the fantasy stuff. The fantasy stuff was good, but I, I think King's at his best when he's writing gritty work, real world stuff um, but as you can see from its point in this in this uh, list I did still enjoy it it is worth sticking with but yeah it is definitely one of those books where the, the start is way better than the middle and the end then we have The Invention of Sound by Chuck Palahniuk. So Chuck Palahniuk being the author of Fight Club, Rant and various other things. Uh, the Invention of Sound is really interesting. It's about a Foley artist, which are the people who make sound effects for films. So you know how you clop two uh, coconuts together to get the sound of a horse's footprints. So she makes these sound effects for film, but the way she does it, instead of like recording someone screaming, um, or instead of, I think the example I gave, instead of recording herself smashing a melon with a hammer to get the sound of someone's head exploding, she will smash somebody's head with a hammer. So she's kind of a serial killer who's recording the audio of her crimes to, um, you know, to be put in films and stuff like that. She makes one sound that's so, like, lethal, it actually makes people kind of go crazy. So it's very cool. Then we have Pygmalion by George Bernard Shaw. So this is what My Fair Lady is based on. I did later watch the movie as well and did enjoy the movie, although Pygmalion has the better ending. It's about Eliza Doolittle and Henry Higgins. So basically this elocution pr uh, professor takes a uh, cockney flower girl and decides he's going to try and teach her to speak like a proper lady and to pass her off in um, you know high society. Some really interesting stuff on like British classes and uh, social mores and stuff. It's just definitely one of those books. I understand now why it's so culturally significant. Then we have Five Patients by Michael Crichton. So this is non-fiction by Michael Crichton. And in this one, it was written in the late 60s and it follows the course of five different patients through the healthcare system. Crichton himself was training to be a doctor um, and he's cr the creator of ER. Like he really knows his stuff when it comes to medicine. But yeah, he told the stories of these real patients and it was just interesting because the addition I got, he then I think done a new introduction to it from like the late 80s, early 90s. And then I'm reading it in 2022, you know? And so it's interesting to see how things have changed and how they haven't. Like even in the 60s, they had an internet connected um, video screening device at an airport because even though a hospital was only a couple of miles away, there was always this rush hour traffic and they couldn't afford to have permanent like hospital staff at the airport. So they did what, what is known as telemedicine, which is increasingly common now, especially because of the pandemic. So it's just really interesting from that point of view and also because I've worked on some books that are about the future of healthcare and health tech and all of this stuff. Then we have Dreamer of June by Brian Herbert. So this is basically a 700 page biography of Frank Herbert written by his son Brian. It's interesting because they, 
didn't always get on. It wasn't really until Brian was an adult that the two of them reconciled. Um, and then Brian, now he's like a really accomplished writer in his, in his own right, uh, pun intended. And so it's just a really moving biography anyway. Sorry, my lights have just gone off in the background. It's a really moving biography anyway, um, but just really well written and about an interesting subject matter about Frank Herbert as well. Very much recommended. Okay, then we have Alias Grace by Margaret Atwood. And this is historical true crime. Um, based on one of the most famous cases of a female murder in Canadian history. Um, there were some strange elements to it, some almost like supernatural elements to it. And you can tell she's done everything she can to tell this story as accurately as she can, but she's had to use some artistic license as well, just because this was, you know, 140 plus years ago. Um, but really moving story. You've got to feel sorry for Grace as well, even though you, I think even at the end, I can't remember whether it does ever clarify if she did it. I think we find out she did do it, but it might have been because of ghosts. I can't remember now, I read this towards the start of the year, but it was very good, definitely recommended. Then we have Catch-22 by Joseph Heller. So, uh, just very funny book about the war, but about the absurdities of war, the absurdities of the human condition. Like, I feel like Albert Camus would have liked Catch-22. Um, I don't know, I haven't asked him. I don't even know when it came out, so he might not have been able to read it because he died in a car crash, didn't he? But um, yeah, Heller is just, is rapidly becoming one of my favourite classics authors. Uh, Catch-22 and Something Happened, both of those are fantastic. Um, kind of parody, um, but also holding up a mirror towards the ridiculousness, again, of army life and the famous Catch-22, um, which I'm not going to explain to you because I'll butcher it. But yeah, read it. It's full of Catch-22s. It's great. And number two, we have A Kiss Before Dying by Ira Levin. So this was interesting because this is pretty much a generic thriller where somebody gets murdered and we don't know who did it. The catch being, um, we know it was one of these three people, um, but we don't know which one. And we know the motives. We actually, the opening is written from the killer's point of view. And then we switch around as someone investigates. And it was just really well done. A masterclass in thriller writing. Uh, made me realize why King, uh, Stephen King is so enamored with uh, Ira Levin. So yeah, if you're into thrillers at all, read A Kiss Before Dying, easily the best one that I've read. And at number one, we have Ira Levin again, this time with Rosemary's Baby, cracking horror novel. Um, a woman moves into a New York brownstone and she has a feeling something weird's going on and basically it kind of turns out her baby is being risen to be like the second coming of Satan for this mad cult. Um, the movie of it was very good as well, but I think in particular what I really liked was the uh, introduction by Levin where he talks about how um, like there's not really any horror that's set in modern places. Obviously there is now, but at the time he was writing, this was a very new thing. Everything was either set in like history or it was stuff like Frankenstein, which was like in the remotes of Scotland or whatever. So um, he kind of modernized horror and for that you gotta love him. But Rosemary's Baby was also just a horrifying read. Um, didn't take too long to get through as well, but grips you from the start to the finish. So definitely one to check out. So there we have it. Those are my favourite books of 2022. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read any of these books and if so, what you thought of them. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.